I was in, uh, I did here to come and talk about knowledge based uh, protection of uh, groundwater, which I will try to do very briefly here in 15 minutes. Uh, I'll start with the take home messages. Cost efficient and knowledge based management of groundwater protection requires mapping and models to design the measures, followed by monitoring of the effective of efficientness of the actions taken. So we have these five M's you have to remember when thinking about uh, groundwater protection. Uh, and the other take home message is that data without context are, is just numbers. And <laughs> now it's been extremely relevant after uh, Joachim's been here because the number of 47 in nitrates says virtually nothing at all. You have to have uh, meter data to tell where, when, how, and then you start having a little more about it, but you also have to have some system understanding how, what part of the system did you take the sample in, uh, some conceptual model about what's going on there to actually say you have knowledge from that number. And I think that's very, very important. Uh, that doesn't make it irrelevant, but uh, you also have to always have to remember a number is nothing in itself. Uh, the Danish challenge, I think, uh, Morten uh, Gausko already read, yesterday started telling that we have, as uh, the Netherlands, very intensive agriculture. Two thirds of the Danish uh, area is under plough. Uh, we have a groundwater based drinking water supply. We have 20 people not drinking groundwater altogether. And we have a very low consumption of bottled water because our drinking water is a very high and good quality. The general end regulation of agriculture has taken place since uh, 1985 and actually has made a difference. Uh, in the recent year, the farmers have uh, started to argue they would like a little more site-specific end regulations because they feel that the regulations uh, now may be unfair because uh, somewhere the environmental objectives might already have been met and why should they be regulated anymore? On the two figures, you say on the top uh, how our groundwater is treated. It's put in through air and then it's filtered through the bottom of this basin and then it's delivered to the consumers without any chlorine or anything else put into it than air. On the bottom figure, you see how the development in the, in the nitrogen surplus in agriculture has been followed by the nitrate uh, uh, Recharged in the, the relevant years, and that there is a, a shift in trend at the same time as the, the shift in trend of the nitrogen surplus. I'll return to that later. Um, and of course, in the beginning, we have to know we have a problem at all with nitrogen still, uh, and monitoring can ask help that kind of answers. It's an easy question to ask. Yesterday, Morton showed how we have some waterworks who still have some. Uh, problems with the nitrite, that's where the red circles are, it's above the drinking water limit. But if you take all data in the national database, you'll see uh, nitrite above the drinking water quality limit, which actually also is the same limit as the EU has in the groundwater directive of 50 milligrams per liter, approximately the same as 10 milligrams of N, all over the country. But of course a map cannot tell anything about the geology, how which depths do we find this is and how many meters of the aquifers are affected. But we do have some kind of problem. If we uh, want to work with knowledge based protection, of course, the first question must be which knowledge do we want? And I think we have to put two kinds of uh, knowledge into the system. There's this intrinsic knowledge about the natural system. Where is the water? How large is the resource? What is the geology like? Uh, and what is the actual and natural groundwater quality where it is, how well is the protection, all that kind of things that doesn't change very much through time. But of course we also have to have knowledge on the measures we may take. What are the pressures we actually want to reduce? How can we do it at all? Um, and look at the, especially to, of course in rural areas, what are the crops, the irrigation patterns, livestock and things like that. The scale of the nitrate regulation in the, when you talk about knowledge based protection, I think it's extremely important. When we started with the groundwater protection in the 80s, it was a national regulation all over our country. And a lot of the goals were quite simply to remove some of the worst and most obvious uh, pollutions and uh, 
where there was to be a big result of, of regulating all farmers in the same way. Uh, the regulation also was uh, later, in, when in 1990 the nitrite directive came, followed up by measures that, as uh, good agricultural practice and norms for how many uh, hectares are you allowed to have per cow and things like that. And modern growers got told a lot about yesterday. I know it's a little late to make an advertisement for him, but uh, you may see his slides perhaps. Uh, we didn't fulfill uh, having good quality immediately, so therefore we uh, turned on to a smaller scale. And on this map you can see the important drinking water areas in blue, and on top of them the green areas which were designated as nitrate vulnerable through a lot of mapping. I'll return to that in a minute. This was possible because we had the legal framework and we also had the economy for it because the waterworks were asked to pay for this mapping and for the measures to be taken. So that's of course an unnecessary thing to take this next step. I'll talk more about that. But in the future we have been discussing do we need an even smaller scale of uh, nitrate regulation to also reach into the areas uh, which are not covered by the waterworks. There's a lot of problems on this, and I think uh, Angela Hoybia tomorrow will uh, bring you a little into this, will not answer all questions, but will talk about some of the challenges there. The Danish concept of knowledge-based groundwater protection I will talk is, is thus the detailed groundwater mapping in the drinking water areas, not all of Denmark, where we have collected a lot of data which has gone on to 3D geological models. It has gone into groundwater numerical models and also into hydrogeochemical models. So it's not only numbers, it's actually a lot of knowledge, which we can then transfer into a protection strategy where we can assess the nitrate vulnerability of the different areas. And for that, we again, when we have this knowledge, uh, use the data again, the geology, we, especially in Denmark, have looked on the protecting clay layers above the aquifer, but also on the hydrogeology, the age of the groundwater, how much recharge do we have, and where is the water infiltrated. And, of course, the geochemistry, how, where is the nitrite, how is the redox conditions, and where is the redox decline. I'll return to that also in a second. But uh, first, I'll discuss a little about what has the national and the site uh, specific uh, strategies, uh, what's, what's the differences? Both the national and the site-specific uh, regulation can help fulfilling the env environmental objectives. I think uh, it's not an either or, it can supplement very nicely each other. But the more site-specific regulation, the more knowledge it needs, and thus models, data, and monitoring. It's also necessary to have a sufficient legal framework because what is possible in a country is very closely related to the legal framework. We heard uh, in some of the meetings that here in the States who often discuss the risk of being sued. That's not so big an issue in uh, Europe. We have uh, other challenges, but the legal framework is, of course, very important for what choices you can make. And then, of course, we have to have the farmers accept what's going on. And uh, in Denmark, they specifically ask it has to be a knowledge-based regulation. Just, uh, just something we feel that this would be a solid uh, scientific base behind. Monitoring the effectiveness of that kind of site-specific protection is still to come in Denmark, but we have uh, efficient national monitoring since uh, 1988. But the site-specific monitoring is not really developed yet. And I've looked a little on the pros and cons and the two ways of looking into it. I have the national general regulation and the more site-specific regulation. In the national regulation, all farmers are affecting, and of course, not everyone will be uh, affected by a site-specific uh, regulation. The management is different, because in the one case, you have common rules which can, uh, with a one size fits all, and, uh, but if you want to take a, a more site-specific regulation, you'll end up having much more uh, local administration and planning. If you have a national regulation, general knowledge may be okay. Uh, on the other hand, you may need a lot of local data. And there's also the cost side. Monitoring, of course, is much more cheap if you only have a national scale. And on the other hand, uh, the, for the agriculture sector, as such, it may be uh, less expensive to have a 
uh, local uh, regulation, but for the individual farmer, it can be a bigger challenge. I talked about we need these uh, models, especially uh, conceptual models. We cannot see the groundwater. We cannot make sense if we don't make some kind of a model. And when it came, comes to groundwater chemistry, I think it's very important. We always think of every sample we take as a part of a 5D system. There's the point in space, X, Y, Z, and then there's the day where we took the sample and the day where the water was recharged. And I know this sounds very easily, but it has very huge implementations and it's often ignored. And I know we had two speakers yesterday talking about uh, the same thing. Uh, we tend to forget this when we get back to our everyday work. In Denmark, we have uh, the nitrate vulnerability uh, built on top of a, a conceptual understanding of the groundwater chemistry. We had here two columns. On the right, we have a lot of different parameters uh, which uh, develop in a characteristic pattern through the, with depth. And on the other side, the nitrate reduction capacity of the soils. In the top, we have what we call water type A, which is oxic. And uh, what we can see there is a very good reflection of the activity on the soils uh, of, uh, and the leaching. When we come into the nitrate reducing zone, which we call uh, water type B, some of the nitrate is already gone, so data from there is not very good if you want to monitor effectiveness. And of course, you cannot see any effectiveness unless of changing nitrate in the reduced zones where we have water types B and C. We can put these water types into a conceptual model of the geology we're in, and if we have any uh, uh, relevant uh, aquifers in the red zone where we have what we would call high vulnerability for nitrite, of course, this would mean we have to take some actions. We also have to, when we come to the more specific, related to the different geological settings we have in Denmark, some of them are more easy as in the West where it's sand, sand, sand. If it's more heterogeneous, there will be a challenge to find out where is the redox line. And if we have a karstic or a fractured uh, situation, it gets even more difficult. If we come to monitoring, it's really a reality check of the effectiveness of the measures. Because uh, groundwater monitoring really is the business of making uh, data for water policy and that kind of stuff. It's not science in itself. There's special focus on making good time series. And monitoring in its nature always looks backwards. If we want to look into the future, we have to have uh, models where we can, of course, use our monitoring data as input but uh, we have to have a numeric model of some kind if we want to look into the future. And I come here with my example that uh, if we just collect the time series, we may end up with just numbers. We have this good time series over the last 30 years going down. We have this bad one always exceeding the, the quality criteria. And we have this ugly one which is really going the wrong way, and of course a real horrible one. <laughs> and I updated these figures when, from when I was here last time, six years ago, and I can see I have no more knowledge at all of if my, any more efficiency of my policy in Denmark. But of course I do have that, and I also showed that last time, because I do have a conceptual model, I do know what's going on, and I do have some dating. So if I sort my data in the three groups and only look at the oxic groundwater where I know I have the signal from the changing in the agricultural practices. I can have the here the three age groups, young, medium and old groundwater. And the downward trends shown in green are increasing as the water gets older. We have the non-significant, where I cannot tell you precisely, and then we have the upward trends, which are certainly decreasing with the younger the water gets. So as that, I can see I have a signal that the, um, all, this, um, all my action plans actually helped. I cannot see here if uh, I actually made it to the uh, objectives, but I can see I'm going in the right direction. So the conclusion is, Data must have context and models are the tool. Choice of scale is also a choice of demand of knowledge. Action plan did improve the general groundwater quality and we have an additional challenge to reach the objectives everywhere under 
all conditions, and that's a question of scale of uh, the uh, regulation. Thank you. Questions? Rebecca, I really liked your presentation. <laughs> Thank you. I have, a, I have a question. Um, in one of your last slides, you show that the nitrate concentration in the younger water is, is a little bit going down, and in the deeper uh, water, older no, the older. Water, it is not necessary depth. It's older. It's going up. Uh, uh, did you also, are you, have you been able to relate that to the type of measures, uh, site-specific measures or uh, general measures? No. So does, does that learn us something about what type of measures are most effective? Or is it just the way it happened and you measure it in the groundwater? No. As I said earlier, we don't have a monitoring program for more site-specific things. It's the overall regulation. That's all we can do with them. And I think that's very important that you know with your monitoring network what kind of questions are you actually able to answer. We have done a lot more work on this dating, but that wasn't the topic for today. I can talk for hours on that, so don't get me started. But <laughs> Okay, thank you. Hi. Thanks for the presentation because you put very clearly many things that I had on my mind and I could not put them as systematic as you did, so thanks. But I have a question that bothers me, as I already said in my presentation before, is that okay? Yeah. That's very neatly in a natural system. But in Denmark, as in Catalonia, these areas have lots of wells pumping at the same time. Therefore, that creates a series of cones of depressions that will, that will intersect each other, creating such a mixing of the groundwater flow field that all this methodology may be compromised, but all this human influence on the flow field. Is that, th that's my feeling. I don't know if you share it or not, or, and if so, how can you address it? Uh, I, I think you have got a point, but I don't think it means that I have to uh, give up and say I cannot use my data. Um, we don't have the intensity and the close, close uh, network of um, uh, irrigation wells that uh, you have, uh, uh, and the waterworks are much more clustered in the areas where we have the monitoring, especially of nitrate. Um, I think that's part of it. 